Good afternoon. I'm Rod Merriam, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the ranges, views, pipelines, currying, and who knows what else. So there's my wife over here. You may have seen her around today. She's from Toronto. She's a, she's a flaming extrovert. She starts talking to you. She'll know your life history in five minutes. So since she's from Toronto, she's got family up here. Toronto. Got to get that right. Toronto. She's correct. Toronto Gregory. So we were up here last year visiting, and the conference was running at the same time. And to make a long story short, Mike got me coming in here for the speaker's dinner last year. So he invited me to the speaker's dinner. So you can blame him for being, you know, me being here today. How many recognize this diet? This. <laughs> I was going to say, how old are you? <laughs> yeah. So this is where I got started in C++. 1990, August, I'm sitting in Waikiki, in their restaurant next to the swimming pool, reading the Borland manuals about, what is this C++ thing? What's this object-oriented stuff? So yeah, that's Borland. C++ IDE, 1990. So what are we doing here? What are we, what are we gonna cover? What are we gonna work on here? I wanna give you a gentle introduction to C++ 20 and 23 ranges. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. I'm not really an expert in it, you know, as you'll see, where I started from and how I got here. But I know enough. My basic goal is when you walk out of here, yay, I'm going to go learn more about ranges. I'm going to learn about pipelines. I'm going to learn all about this stuff and start using it. I'm going to show you currying because everything is getting into functional programming. That's one of the aspects of functional programming, because currying comes really in handy when you're using pipelines, and even going back to some of the standard template library uh, algorithms. So we'll talk about currying. What got me started on this was December 22. It seems like I'm always traveling when something happens. I was on a cruise in the Panama Canal. Simon Toth started writing on medium.com about advent of code every day. He's solving the two problems that come up on the advent and writing an article. And I'm thinking, this is impressive. You know, these are not trivial problems. So I got home and did about the first three days of the advent of code. And I was really just hacking it. I mean, just blunt floors, hacking it. No, no attention to, you know, being cute or suave or anything in there. And I go back and look at his code. And there's some procedure code starting things up, and there's some procedural code ending things, uh, finishing it up. And in the middle of it, it's ranges and pipelines and views. And I said, okay, I've got to look into this a little bit more. Second time you've seen this today. Uh, if you were in Victor's session just a few minutes ago. About 2020, I'm reading these articles about Functional programming is the best thing in the world. You know, by the fanboys, who give you some crappy C++ code, and then say, gee, look how great it is when we do it in functional programming code. I've seen too many of these over my years. You know, it's been decades, and I've seen it over and over again. So I said, I got to figure out a little bit about what's going on. So 2020, I get this book, because it was about C++, and I figured I can understand it uses the ranges v3 library, but you can easily translate it into you know, the current standard. There may be a couple of things missing that the standard hasn't covered yet. I like it because it got some real examples in there. You know, you read the blogs, you read the books, even see the talks. They're kind of toy problems. They don't have enough time to get into much detail. He does get into some detail of you know, how to do things with you know, some real information. Okay, just before we get started, some housekeeping, because I'm going to walk through some project, basically a project here. This is from the advent of code day seven. It was a, basically a command line exercise where you got, you know, change directory, list, this, list of directory, 
get the directory names, get the file names, that sort of thing. This is a C array of characters. Important to keep that in mind. Um, I've got some namespace aliases in here. I bring the ranges down to RNG, bring views down to BWS, and my own personal namespace, MYS for Mystic Lake Software. Um, all this compiled worked on compiled under GC 12.3. I couldn't get it to work on a C line. I don't know whether it's my setup on my Linux system or not, and I didn't want to play much, too much with it and break all the code, break the whole system so I couldn't test the code that I was going to present today. There's a utility class we'll use. Um, all the advent of code stuff reads in a line of data out of files. So I wrote a utility class, read and write a line, puts it in a string, just makes it easy to work with. So here we'll go from a standard template library version to a pipeline in, in easy steps. But first, what's a range? Because we're talking about ranges. And ranges brings a different perspective to working with sequences of data. You have an iterable sequence. And we kind of know what that is because we worked with them from the standard template library, begin and end, first, last. We go to first to last, we can go from last to first, we can jump around in the middle of it, depending on the algorithms we're working with. Note here, first has a square bracket in front of you. That means first is included in this iterable sequence. The parentheses after last means last is not included in the sequence. And again, we're familiar with that because end is not part of the sequence. It's one past the end when we're working with it. And that's what we're used to with containers vectors, lists, arrays, whatever we work with. Add in the concept of a sequence where you know the start and you know how big it is. Again, we're familiar with that. That's a C array, just like I showed you a second ago. Next, we have a start and a predicate, which tells us when we're at the end. That is IO streams. We've gotten into file. That tells us at the end. Now, IO streams is not part of the standard template library. They're two separate libraries. They're on the, in the standard namespace, but they're two separate things. And they kind of layered on iterators onto the uh, IO streams to make them work kind of like containers. But this clarifies it and purifies it a little bit. We're working direct, more directly with streams. And then you've got the sweet unit first, and I don't know when it's going to end. Call those the generators. IOTA, index sequence. Give it a number. Every time you call it after that, it increments it by one. IOTA comes from a programming language, APL. <laughs> yeah. It was a write-only language. Once you wrote the code, you could never understand what it did. <laughs> IOTA was the character they used for an index sequence. So that's why we got IOTA. Standards committee is strange at times. More generally, an iterable sequence is a first. We've got to know the start. And it's a sentinel. All these things we call, we, that can end a range that can detect the end of the range or its iterable sequence is a sentinel. So we've got a new term to, to work with here. OK. We start out by creating a stream. And I'm using span stream. It's new in 23. It's you know, a non-owning layer over the, the, the character array that we had before. Previously, you might use string stream, but that owns it. It copies the data into the stream. This case sits over the top of it, like string view. does not really own the data. It just works over the top of it. We have to specify first and last, and we're using copy. I thought it was really cool the first time I saw, you know, 
somebody use copy to output uh, a vector to, to, to standard out. And uh, oh, that's cool. So I thought I'd use it here. It's different from all the other examples you'll see, so it gets your attention a little bit with copy. So you've got first and last specified. And that's what's you know, required by our classic STL you know, algorithms. How do we convert this to a range? Oh, I'm not going to repeat that span stream line every time. You know, I drop out some of these lines of code, just you don't need to see them every time. So we use the range version of copy. Change the namespace. That's all you got to do to get the range copy. And then we have another way of reading files, iStream view. No. Very important, and this is the first concept you really got to understand. This is the range. Previously, we had first. This is not first. This is the range. This is the whole thing going in there. The compiler and the library is going to figure out what type of range it is, which of the iterable sequences it can be. There's no last. Sentinel figures out, Sentinel is known to ice cream view. It knows what it's looking for, and they're going to look for the end of file. We can directly use C streams, uh, C arrays rather. Don't have to need, don't need a stream. We can access it directly. The Sentinel here, mentioned before, is the array size, and it figures it out for us. All of these would generate this output, <coughs> spread over two columns, just a listing of the information from the uh, command line operations. Now I'm going to, a bit of housekeeping again, what I call automate input and output. I'm going to use auto to create read line, which is just the ice stream view, using my line class and the test file. And we'll create an output line, outline, which does the O stream iterator output. Again, a line using my line class to standard output and put a, a new line in there. So that simplifies things, keeps noise out of the, uh, the slides. <coughs> so let's say, okay, we can do the copy. That's cool. Let's do something a little bit more. Let's say we only want to see the command lines. We're going to create a script from this output, maybe. So we create a lambda, which takes in the line, checks the first character of the line for a dollar sign, returns true if it is, returns false if it's not. And we use a new algorithm out of the Rangers library called filter view. And filter view. If, if the lambda returns true, filter view passes the line on to copy. If it's not, it says, nope, that doesn't work. Give me the next line. So filter view does exactly what it says. It filters based on the predicate that's passed into it. In this case, is command. Let's add another feature, another possibility here. We only want to copy the first five command lines. Well, that's handled with take view. Take view says, I'm only going to give you this many lines, this many, many elements as it passes through. So pass only the first 10 elements to copy using the take view. And the five down there is the count that we're going to use. Now you look at this, and the code is kind of inside out. The read line is buried down below. Then you go through the filter view, which comes up a level. And then you come up with take, which comes up a level, and copy, which comes up a level. You're working backwards. You know, you'd like to read it you know, in order, but it's not. It's backwards. But um, as I said, read lines inside the filter, inside the take. And here's the output from those two versions that we just saw. Now, let's go from 
the range's namespace to the view's namespace. Fairly straightforward. We still use range copy. Note that copy did not have a copy view. There's no equivalent of copy in the view's namespace. So we still use the range copy. We change to the view's namespace for our algorithms. And we drop the view off of the names. We got the exact same output, the exact same processing going on. Why switch? Why use views rather than ranges? Well, I picked up this why use views meow versus range meow view from Barry Revkin's pre Revzin's presentation. He got it from somebody else. It's called mu in this case is meow rather is called a metasyntactic variable. We're used to the using them like foo bar. You know that's a med, you know, we use it just to substitute things in there. I decided I don't want to use foobar anymore because it comes from an unofficial military acronym with profanity in it. So, let's not use that anymore. I'm going to use mew, meow, or mew, or woof, or snort, or something. <laughs> Pipelines. That's what we want to get, learn about views, because with views, we can do pipelines. And the nice thing about pipelines is we get a natural order, as you'll see. We read it across the line, and that's the way the line, it's processed. Mew, why don't I keep saying mew? Meow sits above meow view. Meow calls meow view when it needs to. It doesn't always need to. For instance, if meow gets an empty range, it just returns the empty range. It doesn't need to go to, down to meow view to figure that out. There's a whole list of optimizations that a view can do over the range algorithm. And you will find these in the C++ standard under the section range adapters. Each view is listed there. Because a view is a range adapter. That's the technical name for them. And there's a list for each view of what optimizations it can do. Most of them do pretty much the same optimizations. There's some unusual ones. Some of them don't do any optimizations. They can't because of the way they're, they're going to work. <clears throat> One of the other benefits of this is it can eliminate many template instantiations. If you get it down in meow view, it's meow view, it's going to instantiate a number of templates. If you can avoid that, you save compile time, save run time. Generally, good thing. And you save typing five characters, which isn't you know, negligible, you know, when you're writing a whole line of things out and five characters each time you enter the function. More importantly, it can avoid you typos when you compile something and you come back after how many, however long it took and find out, oh, I typed view wrong. <laughs> so that's the benefit of why you want to use views versus the range versions. So how do we do a pipeline? That's the next step. So we have our read line, we have our filter, we have our take. These are saved off into Dave Brubeck. This is a composition. We've taken all these algorithms, these functions, and put them into a new function, basically. You know, we compose them into one operation with the pipe operator, which we also known as the OR operator. We're overloading the OR operator, just like we did do with IELTS streams. You know, if you write an IELTS stream for a class, you know, we're using the, uh, the symbols for, you know, uh, we've overlo overloaded those operators. OK. Why is this Dave Brubeck? Well, the music at the start that was playing is take five. 
by Paul Desmond, played by Dave Brubeck Quartet, and it was the biggest selling jazz single. single. I did this, and then I saw Barry Resin's talk, and he did the same thing, only he put the musical score down in the corner. So I thought that was interesting. And we take Dave Brubeck, we put it into the copy, copy drives the whole thing. So we got a real simple statement down here, which says what we're doing, copy Dave Brubeck to outline. Our, our pipeline is in natural order. The copy is in natural order. That's very nice. Now, be aware that while this assignment to Dave Brubeck looks like possibly a value assignment, it's not. We're saving off the operation because views, uh, lazy evaluation is how views are, are, are processed. They aren't processed until we get down to this copy. It looks like a value, maybe assigning to a variable. It's not. It's a composition, and the execution is later. That's where they're executed. And there's some tricks on there. For instance, this five. If I put five into a variable and create this line, Dave Brubeck, and then I change that variable to seven, it's not going to be there. The pipeline knows it is five. That's what it's going to use. So I'm playing with these things. And well, yeah, I mean, that's basically getting from a standard template library to a pipeline. You know, it's not complicated. There's a lot of details that you'll get into and you'll see, but you know, it's fairly straightforward. So I was playing with this, and I got frustrated with a couple of places. So here's the typical example. We create Dave Rubick again. We use a range for to you know have Dave Rubick. Dubrack, Dave Brubeck, pull out each element, and we do a standard output with the new line character. This is a typical example you'll see. How do I know it's being passed through the pipeline? Now, this is fairly trivial and fairly obvious what you're, what you're going to see, but you stick a couple transforms in there, and did that transform pass what I thought it was supposed to pass? And did the next one get it? And did it press? So I was out there thinking, well, how do I see what's in there? So I wrote a little utility that I called emit. I come from the embedded systems world, so I tend to not think in print or write. It's emit. You know, you send something out on a pin. The next one is, why do I have to a distinct, have a distinct loop here? Why can't I stick something at the end of the pipeline and make it run? Well, you can. But I'm going through Stack Overflow and got this response because somebody else asked a similar question. And the guy's uh, response was, because of lazy evaluation. Well, OK. Why does the implementation drive my usage? I mean, yeah, it does to an extent, but why? I'm not going to follow the rules. So I developed eval and eval view utilities. So I can just write a pipeline, put it at the end, and you know, execute it. The emit utility, I, I, I think it's interesting to see you know, what I did here for your own purposes long term, not necessarily that these are great things to use. So emit is a lambda. And it returns a filter. Filter here has a lambda, which takes the delimiter that's passed in, does the output with the delimiter, and returns true to say, OK, keep this value. As I said, it returns the filter function. And Usually I'm fairly certain of what's going on, but there's always, particularly with something new, you know, that little bit of doubt. Is this really returning the filter, or is the filter being executed down here? Now, the reason I was pretty sure 
it was returning the filter is because if it wasn't, the pipeline wouldn't work. Pipeline would come back and say, no, I don't know what emit is. Don't use it. You can't go away. Don't bother me anymore. So I went into Sea Lion and said, looked at, said, what is this actually returning? And it comes back and gives me this thing, standard views, adapter, partial, standard view, yeah, 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 yeah. The key word, as I mentioned a slide ago, was range adapter. This is adapter. So that told me, yeah, this is returning the filter itself. And thank you, Otto. I would hate to have to type that out and figure out what was supposed to go in there. One of the best things in sliced bread. Well, yeah, we got to return the true. And I created a couple of specializations of it with uh, new line character and a tab character so that, you know, don't have to type that every time I want to use it. Eval view and eval. So we create a struct. And we create an operator, NOR operator, pipeline operator, just like we create with IO streams. First thing is going to be the, the view that we're taking in. Maybe better call the range, but that's what I called it. And eval struct is the, sec the right hand parameter on it. We're not going to do anything with that. So once we've got the operator defined, we have a loop which pulls each of the elements from the view and does nothing with it because we don't want to do it. We just want to drive the pipeline. And I borrowed the placeholder underscore, which is in element, uh, which is in uh, the standard for C26. And it just says, ignore this thing. The original version of it had like a V there and then, you know, maybe not, maybe unused on there. So this simplified that little bit of code. And then I created a function which takes the input range, passes it in, uses the pipeline to evaluate it, does everything else, does exactly what we want. Note here, range input range. This is a concept. Concepts are a key part of the ranges library. Way too much information to go to even in an hour talk if I had the full thing. But once you get into ranges, you will get into concepts to understand what's happening. So let's see what happens when we actually use this. We don't have to do the auto. We just have to put the read line and we add in two emit tabs and an emit new line. So we see exactly what's happening every step of the way. And we use eval to drive the pipeline. Note there's no auto here. We're doing this right here. We're not saving anything off. And we get the output. And what is all that output? You know, where did all that stuff come from? Don't sprain your eyes. I got it on the next slide. So we start out. And I inadvertently did this in my first working with things where I stuck an output in some lambda and saw it. And, you know, you get this thing, you know intellectually what's going on, but it's not really, you know, in here, in the heart. You don't, you know, you still think, oh, this is doing some batch operation and, you know, not doing element by element. This spells it out clearly. So the first two lines come in, and the first, column here is what's being read. The next is what filter has passed on. And the last, the third uh, column here is the uh, uh, what take allows. So we've got filter and take working here fine. Take says, OK, I got two. And then filter comes along with all the next stuff that's being read in. And it's not command line. So all we're seeing is what's being read. Finally, it gets to another command line. It likes it, passes it to take. Take says, great, I got three. Next line, take says, I got four. Then we got the repetition where we skip over some stuff and take says, I got five and we're done, right? Nope. 
what's the stuff at the bottom here? The, the, you know, the last things for um, the last two command statements. And that's fifth take. We have to go one beyond. Remember the parentheses. And is one beyond where we're going. So take, so read reads in the sixth element. Filter says, hey, good, it's a command. Take says, okay, now we're done. So again, that's kind of one of the, yeah, intellectually you get it, but you know, until you kind of see it spelled out like this, you don't get it fully. Don't come back to me two years from now and tell me I've been using emit and eval and in the pro I've been working fine in production and somebody changed something and it broke. Uh-uh. Don't use these. Not in production. Maybe for debugging, maybe for testing, for playing around. It's more to illustrate what you might be able to do. These are not production quality. There's a whole raft of things you need to do to create a view, derive from a view, a base class, and other hoops to jump through, pipeline similar, using concepts in there to make sure you're getting you know, the right definition of what you want. These don't do any of those things, so don't use them. But you can return a view algorithm as from your own function. So that's one thing that's illustrated with the min. And it shows a dirty pipeline operator. That's at least the starting point for you know, creating a pipeline operator. You'll notice that filter takes a single argument, a function as its argument. Well, technically it takes two. It takes the value that you're passing, it takes the range, and it takes the uh, element that you're going to be working with. If we want to take, say we've got some big complex algorithm, and we want to modify it, we want to add a parameter in here um, to make it a little bit different. In our simple example here, we're going to say, OK, we don't want the dollar sign to be a constant. We want it to be a variable that we're passing in, an argument. Maybe we want to change it to a D so we can get all the names of the directories. So we take and we create command bad hint that this isn't going to work. And we add in a second parameter, which is the character that we want to pass in. And we test the character against the first element, first character in the line. And we try and do this. And you'll get an error message that boiled down to says, no, you can't do this. Filter requires a function with a unary argument. All you can have is one argument in there. And that is actually the element that's passed into filter along. I'm sorry. That's the, the predicate that passed into filter has to be a unary function. So how do we get around that? <clears throat> and it applies not only to here, but there's numerous places in the standard template library where you're trying to pass in you know, a function and to, uh, to an algorithm, and it only take a unary um, function, as the case may be. And we went through hoops of like, creating a class and with an, opera uh, an invocable operator and pass that in. You know, so the constructor gives you the other, other information, various ways of doing it. possible solutions, we can create a function like emit, which takes you know, an existing filter or transform or something else and you know, does the, everything behind the lines, behind the scenes, and then returns something that the pipeline will accept. It may not be robust. As I said, you've got to do a number of steps to make sure you get a view that works properly and safely, robustly. You also get into the readability problem is you've just buried what people normally see in pipelines in a function that you've created. So you've got to make sure the name you've got is correct. You know, I'm filtering the first character 
et cetera. So as a solution, may not be the best one. There's standard bind. And that's a way of patching you know, arguments together and passing them in. And that's another very reasonable solution. Drawback is it's a library function. The compiler can't always optimize library functions as well as you'd like. You want to stick to the language functions, language built-in language features. Currying is how you do this by using lambdas. You can stack lambdas to create this currying, and then the compiler can go in and optimize because it's a language feature. So what's this currying stuff? Oh, and yes. Yay, it's functional programming, so we get to pat ourselves on our back, and the fanboys love us. Uh, what is currying? Also known as Schrumpfenkung. <laughs> I got that from uh, Renard Graham Grimm. He mentioned it in one of his blog posts. And uh, so apparently curry and Schrumpfenkung fin 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 um, came up with the same, uh, same thing, same argument here. And Schrumpfenkung means pretty finches, by the way. So what they said is you can reduce any n-ary function to a series of unary functions. So we can take the trinary function, just to illustrate, f of a, b, c, to three unary functions, f of a, of b, of c. In other words, if we have a function g, that takes a unary function h of i, we can call g with f of a of b of c. So curry is command, can be used as filter test line, change the name to test line, parentheses d, if we do a, if we curry it. But you said test line, is it has to be a unary function to filter. Yeah, but we're returning a function which is a unary function. It's not, this is not the function that is actually being passed into filter. Nomenclature in F of A, B, C, B and C are the trailing arguments. A is the main argument. I'll mention that and why that's important in a second. So let's look at currying all this. And we'll define some requirements. We want to test the first character in the line for a specific character, and we want to use a specific test. Right now, we've been using e equality, but maybe we want to see the lines that are not command lines. So we want to test for not equal to a dollar sign as the first character. If we wrote this straight lambda, you know, if it would work, which it won't, it would look something like this. Line test has got a line as its, for, as its first parameter, a character, and a function. Pass in a function. So in effect, what we need to create, though, is something that would look like line test is first parameter is the constant character. Next parameter is the standard function and then the line. And yes, these are in the correct order. The trailing arguments come first. How would we use this? Well, we've got read line, and then we would say filter, line test dollar sign as our first parameter. Next parameter is not equal to as the function. And we don't see the line the element that's being passed in, that's handled automatically. And we got emit new line and eval. I took out the take because it's just not necessary for this discussion. So this lambda will exclude anything with a dollar sign on it. 
How do we do this? Well, it's lambdas all the way down, like turtles. You know. Line test first, lambda. Let me skip back and see what we've got coming up on here. So the first lambda, first two lambdas are simply capturing the trailing arguments. We get the test character, we pass it as a capture to the next lambda which is going to get the function that we want to use. Both of those are passed and captured to the third lambda. Recall that lambdas are classes. And there's two methods that may be inst uh, instantiated when you have a lambda. One is the operator call, the, op the call operator, which is where our parameters come in. The other is a constructor. And the constructor is what you get the, the capture list gets passed to the constructor, and, L and member data members are included in the class to uh, hold what was been passed in as the capture. So we capture all the other arguments, and then we finally have our last parameter, which is what filter is going to pass in to this lambda. And then finally, the last line here, all right. The last line here is the actual execute the function against the two characters that we're going to test. The first one in the, uh, the line and our, our test character. I didn't confuse everything on the last slide with default parameters, but you may want to pass those in. So we can do it as we would do, would do it normally. Um, you know, do the equal dollar sign for the test character we can say equal to is our, our function. It's the same thing. Note the bottom line there. If you're using all the default parameters, you still have to put the parentheses in there. You've got to invoke the call operator. So even though you're using the defaults, the parentheses have to be there for the two outer lambda functions. So. I get into these, and I'm kind of scratching my head about what is this thing actually doing? C++ Insights. And Andreas is the originator of C++ Insights. He's talking uh, at, our, at the conference. Um, so I created two lines, one just two code lines. Just wanted to create a line um, and one to invoke test line with the default parameters and pass in line, invoking this directly, not through filter. And we want the results to go into a variable res. So here's what the compiler generates. Calls, first of all, it creates a Boolean. Hey, good, that's what we want is a Boolean output on this. Line test, call line test with the operator call with the call operator passing in the character. And it chains to another call operator from the next lambda, which passes in the function that we want. And then finally, it chains to the operator where we actually pass in the line that's going to do the testing and return the Boolean valid value to the filter. I thought it was interesting how it all ties everything together. Talk faster than my typing here. <clears throat> How do you create a curried lambda? Just to give some, you know, quick rules of thumbs. First lambda is lambdas receive the trailing arguments. That's why I mentioned specifically what trailing arguments are. The final lambda, um, okay, and they pass through capture to the lambdas each step along the way. Final lambda receives the unary value from the calling algorithm, in this case, filter. Final lambda then executes the actual function 
and you know, returns it to the calling algorithm. In this case, filter is what we were interested in. Currying adds flexibility to pipelines. You can stick in you know, this currying to expand the capabilities, testing whatever you're doing to pass in values to your actual function that you want to perform and still sticking with, staying with some known names on the, in the pipeline. You know, everybody knows what take is, everybody knows what filters is, they know what transform is. They see something else strange in there, then they got to think a little bit harder and that's difficult for some people. So, okay, hope you enjoyed this journey. Uh, hope you enjoyed CPP North and get a little time to see Toronto. It is a great city. Now go learn more about the Ranges Library. Enjoy.